Good morning, welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 17th of February um, and this quick look at the week ahead beginning the 20th of February with me Michael Hewson. Um, it's certainly been one of those weeks where it's been difficult to determine a direction unless you're looking at the FTSE 100 or the CAC Courant, both of which have made new record highs this week and I haven't changed my mind about the FTSE 100, I still think there's potential for further upside there. Um, but I think what we have seen this week is a little bit of a change to the cosy consensus that had developed around the 25 basis point rate hike from the Federal Reserve consensus and the fact that disinflation was likely to be a one way route to the downside. This week's data have really, I think, prompted a, an awful lot more uncertainty about the stickiness of inflation. And I think that's no better illustrated in this week's US CPI numbers, but more importantly than that, in the PPI numbers that we saw earlier this week. If we, if we look back at first and foremost at the CPI numbers for January, US CPI numbers for January, they came in slightly above expectations of 6.4 percent it was still a, it was still a modest decline from december's six and a half percent but it was above expectations of 6.2 core prices were also stickier than expected slipping from 5.7 percent to 5.6 percent due to upward revisions to previous months month on month numbers were in line with expectations but i think one thing is apparent while inflation is coming down, it's coming down slower than expected. And that won't give the Fed confidence that it is on top of the inflation problem. Um, and that really extends also to the PPI numbers that came out in January as well, not only on month on month, but on year on year. December also saw upward revisions to the underlying numbers on both headline and core. So year on year PPI came in at 6%. That was down from an upwardly revised 6.5% and well above forecasts of a drop to 5.4. I mean, that was a, that's a big forecast drop, which ultimately didn't come in. Well, core came in at 5.4, which was also well above forecasts of 4.9. Now, a large part of the reason for the stickiness, the increased stickiness on US PPI was higher energy costs, gasoline, uh, natural gas. And while we saw a really, really decent retail sales numbers out of the US January numbers, a rise of 3%, that came off the back of two successive months of 1% declines. So November and December ended really poorly in the US. We've seen a fairly decent rebound, or more than decent rebound, in January and I think the bigger question is whether or not that's sustainable. When you look at weekly jobless claims consistently below 200,000 and you've got to argue essentially that the US economy is much more resilient than was thought to be the case at the end of last year. That would mean that wage growth is likely to be an awful lot stickier and uh, average weekly earnings, average hourly earnings are probably not a good benchmark when measuring um, US wage inflation and that the Fed will probably need to go a lot longer um, than markets are pricing in or have been pricing in and that's no better illustrated in this US two-year yield chart. We've broken above that cosy consensus of between four and four and a half percent over the past few days. Let me just zoom that in a bit for you. There we go. Basically, this was the range, bottom of the range, it's around about 4%. Obviously, that was the payrolls numbers, um, which saw the big jump higher. Ever since then, we've seen US economic data surprise to the upside, and we've now broken above 4.5%, and, and, and we could well be heading back to 4.8%. So as we look ahead to next week, um, as well as looking back at this week's numbers, I think the thinking is now starting to shift and we've got Fed minutes which are due out on the 22nd of February. Now, if you cast your mind back to Powell's press conference, he seemed very coy about 
what was discussed at the meeting when it comes to differences of opinion, um, perceptions of how long rates were likely to stay at current levels, um, didn't really push back at um, markets pricing of um, where rates were likely to go about financial about financial conditions. He was directly asked if he felt that financial conditions were too loose. And he said that they were no looser than they were at the end of December, which to my mind um, was complete nonsense. They were much looser um, than they were at the end of December. I said September to I meant December. I mean, this is this is the end of this is sort of the, the roundabout um, mid January. And as you can see, they're, they're probably the loosest they've ever been in terms of the two year yield. Since the payrolls numbers, we've seen US two year yields move back to where they were at uh, the beginning of November. So we've seen a significant tightening of uh, rates. And now the bond market appears to be pricing a much more hawkish Fed, even if equity markets are not. What's also happened since then is that Loretta Mester of the Cleveland Fed has said that she saw a compelling case for a 50 basis point rate move at the last meeting. Now that's really unexpected development because Powell's press conference certainly gave no indication the Fed members were sort of leaning in any way hawkish and that there was any significant division. Now, Mester is not a voting member. So her views on where rates might go or that they're not going to have that much of an influence. But if she's thinking that, then who else is potentially thinking that? And certainly Neil Kashkari, who is a voting member, has been quite vocal in recent weeks about the need for a Fed funds rate of above 5.25%. So that would suggest that perhaps her view is not an isolated view. And certainly James Bullard of the St. Louis Fed, who's also not a voting member this year, has said that he could, he could certainly consider a 50 basis point rate hike in March after having seen a slowdown to 25 in January. So these could all be trial balloons. These could all be just jawboning rates higher to try and tighten financial conditions in light of the recent stickiness of those CPI and PPI numbers. Certainly it's having an effect. We can certainly see that in the US two-year yield. We can certainly also see it in the way UK gilt yields are pricing higher, even though UK inflation did see a big drop in this week's numbers to 10.1 percent and again that had the market starting to price out the possibility that the bank of england might hike rates again in march now let's get real the bank of england will probably still have to hike rates in march why because if they don't the pound will go lower and inflation will become much stickier they're in a hole of their own making here they were behind the curve when it came to initially hiking rates and now if they are to keep a floor under the pound and try and keep downward pressure on inflation, they are going to have to keep hiking if the Fed keeps hiking. There's no two ways about it. One of the main channels for inflation within the UK is the value of sterling. And there's no way around that. You can't sugarcoat that. It is a fact. And the fact is that the pound is much lower now than it was 12 months ago. So there is a significant um, upward draft on inflation through the exchange rate mechanism of sterling. So the Bank of England will probably have to go by 25 basis points to 4.25% and potentially go even higher, particularly when you look at wages, which are trending in the private sector of over 7%, likely to go higher because of um, recent new pay rounds, which have seen 18% for bus drivers. So the market is once again underpricing the risks of a Bank of England rate hike and the Bank of England potentially being more aggressive. So inflation is not going away. And while rates continue to go higher, I think there's a fairly decent chance um, that uh, the FTSE 100 will continue to outperform because of a value as opposed to growth. The economic data has been better um, than expected.
and we have seen the FTSE 100 hit my initial 8,000 target. We're above that. I still think we can continue to go higher on the FTSE 100. Um, we're certainly in the up. We're still we're, we're in the same uptrend that we've been in since the October lows. Again, if we get any dips back, we should find support in and around 78, 87,900. But for the moment, the trend is your friend. So don't fight it. Look to buy into weakness and stop, you know, try and avoid if you can to pick the top. DAX again, that's traded sideways this week. It's been pretty uneventful. It's underperformed relative to um, the FTSE 100 and the CAC Caron. Nonetheless, we're still very much in an uptrend and the DAX should continue to slowly work its way higher. If we look at the CAC Caron, that briefly hit, sorry, wrong chart, that briefly hit a record high earlier this week, just a marginal record high, I might add. That was the previous record high, 73.85.4, 73.87, 73 73.88. So it's a marginal record high, uh, but ultimately um, the likelihood is that while the trend is in place, then we are very much in buy the dip mode. US markets, on the other hand, different story entirely. Let's look at the NASDAQ to begin with. Again, the NASDAQ is holding below the, that key resistance level at 12,850. Um, it's still chopping around, and while it may not come crashing off, I think it's going to struggle um, at current levels, particularly if US data continues to surprise to the upside. Um, I think the key support on the NASDAQ is essentially going to be these lows from the 10th of February last Friday, which was 12,200. So keep an eye on those lows there. S&P 500 similarly struggling just above 4150 in and around 4180 there or thereabouts it's slightly more it's slightly more um uh, you know, jaggedy in terms of the moves but the bottom the bottom of the range at the moment is around about 4050 but certainly there is also bigger support in and around this 4000 area 3998 4000 but if we do break below there then we could start to sink back towards this trend line support from the lows back in October. So essentially, we're still in an uptrend for US markets. It's just that um, upside is going to continue to be slightly contained while the dollar is strong and yields are edging higher. Okay, so those are those are the key those are the key indices. Euro dollar, strong dollar, pushed Euro dollar lower. We've rolled over the 50-day moving average. We found resistance in and around this 108 area, 107.80. As you can see, that low there, that peak there, and that peak there has managed to contain the upside. The next support area comes in around about 106.10, 105.80. But I think the key level that I'm targeting is really the lows this year at around about 104.80. I think we can potentially slip back there if, if we if we look at these series of lows through here. There's certainly fairly decent support in and around the 200 day moving average um, as well as this trend line here so is that there is scope for us to move lower on euro dollar not massively so i might add but certainly i think there's scope for us to drift back down towards this trend line in this period of dollar strength as we head towards that next fed meeting in march now, i mean the ecb is still talking tough when it comes to rate policy that's helping euro sterling but sterling is obviously suffering on the back of the fact that markets think rightly or wrongly that um, the ecb has more scope to raise rates than the bank of england and i suppose in some respects they do um certainly i think we're already we already know we're getting another 50 basis points in march from the ecb because lagarde madame lagarde has said so the bigger question is really what comes after that but certainly, I think in terms of what we're seeing in euro sterling, the line of least resistance looking at the price action is for a potential move back to these peaks in February of around about 89.80. What happens after that is anybody's guess. But if we look at the way euro sterling has behaved over the course of the past year, 
it's consistently found the air very thin above 8980 and has struggled to really make any sort of tangible gains any time that it's moved above that particular level. So I'm certainly not calling for a move much above 90, even at this stage in, in time. Dollar yen, seen a significant shift in my bearish dollar yen view. Certainly if we look at the way the, the price action has behaved over the course of the past few days, the bullish, the, the, the higher yields that we're seeing um, across the US yield curve is helping push dollar yen higher. Obviously, we do get a new central Bank of Japan, a Bank of Japan governor, Ueda, um, in April. He's probably not likely to be as dovish as Kuroda, but we are still two or three months away from his appointment. So there's certainly plenty of time in the interim for the dollar to potentially go back to the 200 day moving average, which is above 136, as well as obviously this cloud resistance here, this red line here, which we can ascertain comes in. We just roll that cursor in there. We can tell the value of that Kumo 2 line is 137.95. That's on the left hand side of the graph there. You've got um, a value window. You've got Ichimoku, Kumo 1, Kumo 2, 131.96 on the downside and 137.95 on the upside. Obviously that then moves down as you move it across. But these Kumo lines generally do tend to act as fairly decent support and resistance. So certainly I think there's potential for us to move to the 200 day moving average at 136.74 and potentially 137.95 if we move beyond that. But obviously these lines could start to coincide sometime next week. So they could become one and the same as time goes by. So certainly keep an eye on Kumo 2 and the 200 day moving average when looking at dollar yen. Okay, so um, as I say, we've got the Fed minutes on Wednesday. Um, the interventions by Mester and Bullard make for a little bit of a change to the narrative and, does and, and essentially raises two questions. These two questions are one, is to how many other Fed members saw a compelling case for a 50 basis point move at the last meeting. Okay, and in two, how much could that have shifted over the last few weeks in light of the recent strength of US data? The minutes should answer question number one. Question number two will take a little bit longer to answer and ultimately we'll need to see more data, but certainly in terms of labor market, in terms of um, broader, economic data, the move to lower inflation is likely to be a choppy one and likely to invite further Fed rate hikes over the course of the next few, next, next few weeks and months, which yes, we'll get a hike in March. It'll probably be 25 and we will probably get a hike in May and we could, we'll see further hikes into the summer months as well. Um, we've got US core PCE deflator on the 24th. That's fallen back sharply in the last two months of November and December. The big question is whether that trend continues in January. So the, D, the PCE deflator could actually take some of the edge off yields if it continues to fall. If it doesn't and does what CPI and PPI did, then obviously that will reinforce the higher yields narrative that we've seen start to play out in the US bond markets. We've also got fourth quarter GDP, second iteration of fourth quarter GDP from the US. Um, that's likely to remain unchanged at around about 2.9%. Um, personal consumption was a little bit disappointing at the end of last year. I think in Q1 though, that that's going to bounce back very, very strongly, particularly with respect to the US retail sales, which saw a which saw a very strong bounce back in the control group, which generally is well is positive for the US economy because the control group measure of retail sales is included in US GDP calculations. So um, that would suggest that we're going to see a very strong Q1 if that continue if the trend continues on the back of a strong January into February and March. In terms of earnings. Um, or oh, sorry, before I mention, before I say anything else, we've got EU CPI, and again here, 
um, we've seen a little bit of softening there. Uh, recent German CPI numbers would appear to suggest it's a little stickier than perhaps the ECB would like. The most recent flash numbers for January saw headline CPI fall from 9.2 to 8.5 percent, which was a bigger fall than expected. But core prices increased. They didn't fall, they went up. So they went up to 5.2 percent on an annualized basis from 5.1. So again, headline pressures, headline inflation is easing, core is rising. And that's the key measure that we really need to be paying attention to as traders and investors. In terms of earnings this week, banks continue. Um, we've seen disappointing reactions to um, NatWest's latest numbers. The, the share price, as I speak, is down 6%. You can see that in this little graph here, big fall there, but it's well off the lows. And the fact of the matter is, I think it's that is well overdone, that reaction, because they posted a decent set of numbers. Um, but in the Q3 numbers, the share price dropped quite sharply. It's a lot higher now. So I think we could be seeing a similar sort of reaction play out. This week, we've got Lloyd's Banking Group. Um, uh, full year numbers. Let's see if I can get my words out. Again, we've seen a little bit of a drop back today on the back of the NatWest numbers, a little bit of what I would call a sympathy move lower. But uh, again, um, if 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 um, if NatWest Q4 numbers are any guide, there's only been a very modest slowdown in mortgage lending. There was a little bit of an outflow in current account balances and deposits in Q4 mainly down to the fact that I think people were dipping into their savings. But if we look at the overall direction of travel when it comes to the Lloyds Bank share price, it's still very positive. And we saw retail sales in January come in slightly better than expected this morning. So certainly there's a decent trend line on the Lloyds, the recent move higher in the Lloyds Bank share price, as long as we stay above that uh, broader trend line higher then the uptrend should remain intact. And what's actually encouraging, I think, for me, is that we've been able to hold above uh, this series of peaks through here around about 48p. And what is also interesting about Lloyd's bank shares is that the bank is more profitable than it's ever been uh, over the last 10 years, and yet it's still well below the levels it was pre-COVID, which suggests to me that of all the banks, there's some serious underperformance going on there and perhaps as long as things continue to not look as bad or as dark as people think there is certainly potential for an awful lot more upside when it comes to the trend that we're currently seeing play out at the moment. Rolls-Royce another one here which has been a serial underperformer has gone and started to gain traction towards the upside again a little bit of a top here in and around 115 115p, seen a little bit of a pause. We're currently holding above 105. I think the big question here is that, you know, what's the new CEO going to, what's the narrative the new CEO, Tufan Ergen Bilgic, is going to be telling us now that he's got his feet under the table and replaced Warren East? When he took over earlier this year, he really didn't hold back. Um, when he was talking about the challenges facing the current business, he likened the company to a burning platform. His words sent the shares off their recent highs. You can see that there. They found a bit of a base at around about 104, and they've gone and back and retested those highs. One of the, I mean, there's no question, the company has its problems. Heavy reliance on its civil aer aerospace division was and still is to a certain extent a notable weak spot. But even here, there are grounds for optimism. Airlines are returning to their pre-COVID flying patterns. You look at the airline numbers that we've seen this year, EasyJet, Ryanair, Wizz Air, Jet2, TUI, IAG, British Airways, Lufthansa, KLM, they're all ramping up their timetables. And as long as we don't get a repeat of what we saw last summer, then it could be a fairly good summer for airlines. Rolls-Royce has won an order from Air India, or Airbus has won an order for Air India for um, a whole host of new jets powered by Rolls-Royce engines. So certainly I think in terms of what we're looking at going forward, the big question is how much bad news 
is already in the price. I mean, look at this share price. I mean, the the decline has been, well, it's, it speaks for itself. Back in July, August 2018, the shares were up at 343, 374. They're barely below 115 now. So an awful lot of the bad news is in the price. The big question is, can Rolls-Royce continue to improve, improve its cash flow um, and start to generate a consistent cash flow and a consistent profit. And I think that's what investors will be looking for when they look ahead to this week's um, full year numbers. So that's Rolls-Royce that we're looking at for later this week, and that is on the 23rd of February. Lloyds Banking Group is on the 22nd. We've got HSBC as well on the 21st. Um, we've also got a couple of big US earnings numbers. And we've got IAG as well, full year numbers from for, on the 24th. And they've got off to a flyer this year as well, as I mentioned when I was talking about Rolls-Royce. So keep an eye out for their full year numbers on the 24th. NVIDIA, going to look at NVIDIA, chip maker. Again, that's performed fairly well in recent days and recent weeks, if I can actually get the chart to load. Let's just kill that because I don't think it wants to play. Um, oh, there we go. Took its time. There we go. So again, that's finding a little bit of resistance um, at around about $230, $230. And in terms of its Q4 guidance, its Q4 guidance, revenue guidance was $6 billion plus or minus 2%. It has has it it's, it has had its problems, but I think one of the, one of the one of the things that it should do well from is demand for high specification AI chips. Um, Nvidia is a key supplier in this area. Profits are expected to come in at 81 cents a share, and after a disappointing first half, perhaps the outlook for Nvidia could be an awful lot better than was thought to be the case when we were talking about the numbers back in. Q3. Okay, so I think that's it for this week. Also, Walmart. Don't forget Walmart. That's a good that's a good gauge of the US consumer. Keep an eye out for those numbers on the 21st, Q4, full year. Um, given the fact that retail sales were so strong in January, perhaps we could see a decent set of numbers from Walmart. Anyway, that's it for this week, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for listening. This is Michael Hewson talking to you from CMC Markets.